Well, on the one hand, you know, when they were developed in the 60s, uh, people looked and, and saw this issue. The world population seemed to be increasing. We know that the number of people in the world has a big impact on global resources. And people looked and said, well, you know, fertility is lower in industrialized and in developed countries. Many developing countries are undergoing what was called the demographic transition, or today we might say fertility transition, from high fertility to low fertility, coupled with low mortality uh, and longevity. And so really we need to focus on those people in these developing countries and get them to limit their fertility. Of course, but having someone in Africa, and this is a, and right now I'm not addressing some of the other issues around family planning, such as power between men and women, which is a huge issue, or women's education. I'll tell you, I'll take a second and go on a tangent, which is I spent many, many years working in Sub-Saharan Africa, especially in Botswana, which is a landlocked country. Everybody says a landlocked country the size of Texas in South Central Africa. And I lived in very small, remote villages and, and where we had, were completely isolated from national infrastructure. And one day, uh, uh, when talking, to, at that time I didn't have any kids, uh, talking to uh, local women in the community, her friends, my wife mentioned that, you know, we didn't have kids yet, and uh, people were, you know, very, very, you know, the, now the door had been opened up to this. And, you know, why don't we have kids? She said, well, you know, we have medicine that can stop a woman from having kids. And so women were all of a sudden saying, give me some medicine. Where do I get it? But more importantly, why can't I have it? Why do you get it? What is it about my life that I can't have that medicine too? Right? So these issues are, are very broad. And if we look at, at this, though, from the question of population, we can put a lot of effort into getting people in Africa or South America or Asia to limit their fertility. And especially the African example, because it's sort of the most extreme, a person having one less child in Africa is the same as 13 people in our society having one less child. So where should we devote those resources in terms of family planning exercises? Is this because it's much easier when we have influence over people with less power, with less resources, we can get them to do it so we don't have to. So that's one of the questions I want to put to you. Um, the next thing I wanted to bring up, so the next set of ideas of, of that relate to power and tension, is the ideas behind the protection of natural resources. Now, a lot of you are, well, who's familiar with tragedy of the commons? A few people, and really, when we talk about research, it's, a, it's really the tragedy of the unmanaged commons is one way to, probably an important way to think about it. But in a sort of general sense, this is the idea that when there are communally held resources, that those are everybody owns, then because no one's responsible, people can overuse them and deplete them. And here is, for instance, overgrazed territory, right? So if the pastures are communally owned, everyone puts their cattle in the pasture, they're depleted, well, why would an individual take their cow out, or their cows, if their neighbor is going to continue to use the resources and deplete it, right? So this was recognized by uh, Garrett Hardin about 40 years ago. And we can say that, that it makes altruism a very difficult way to uh, manage natural resources, because people it's asking some people to sacrifice what others do not, and so the benefits accrue to those who do not sacrifice, and the cost accrues to those who do sacrifice. And it's not a very sustainable kind of system because the resource gets depleted. And of course, a great example of this right now is our fisheries, where, well, as you've heard, we've taken 90% of the fish out of the ocean. Right? So there's fisheries collapsing all over the world. And who owns the fish? 
Well, for a long time, people would say something was too big to count. They'd say because it's as many as all the fish in the sea. But gee, now we can count all the fish in the sea and there aren't all that many of them, right? And this is because anybody with a fishing boat can essentially, in the open ocean, fish as much as they want. And who is there to stop them? So we see lots of resources like this. Water. You know, when I was living in a small village in Botswana, we would get our water from the Okavango River, which is a, a, a river uh, that rises in the rainforest of Angola. But we're in the Kalahari Desert. It's a really dry place, but there's a river going right through the middle. And so every day, everybody in the village, including me, would get their bucket or their, their pot or whatever they had to uh, use to carry water and make the trek down to the river, which was, you know, not that far, maybe half a mile downhill. And unfortunately, someone, someone made the mistake and put the river downhill. And I, I don't know how that happened. Anyway, so downhill to the river, fill up their bucket uh, or their pail, whatever, and carry it up back up to where we lived. I you know, spent several years doing this all the time. Um, and so you learn to appreciate the use of water. So a bucket, you might have two, three, four gallons of water in it, which when you're collecting it that way and it's 120 degrees out, you really care about that water because you have ownership of that water. You've gone and gotten that water. Now, of course, what do we do with that much water? Well, every time you go to the bathroom, okay? Um, and so, you know, resources like that, if there, and water here, of course, is not costly in terms of time or energy. It's extremely cheap. And so, we import a great amount of water. We use a lot of energy to bring water here. We now recycle our toilet water. So we're, we're uh, 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 doing a little more conservation, and Orange County is a leader in that. But still, it, there's very little incentive to increase the amount of water use. And this, of course, is also not sustainable. And here in places like Orange County, in 20 years, having sort of free, clean, abundant water is not going to be, it's not going to be free or very cheap. And so, the cleaner the water you're going to want, the more you're going to have to pay for it. So this is you know, one of the issues we face. So as I mentioned, there, there are a couple different uh, approaches people have had um, to tragedy of the commons. One is appeal to altruism, uh, sort of hortatory uh, ideas that people should, should sacrifice. It works uh, sometimes. Privatization is another way that's been very popular. Uh, in some places, for instance, Governments have privatized the water system, right, for this purpose. Uh, of course, there are very high prices associated with this and high costs associated. Um, but this is the way in our society that we have chosen to protect most uh, natural areas that people are interested in preserving. The American National Park model. So this is actually a real model, right? This is a National Park on a table, but it's sort of the same idea that to build a barrier, and that's an isolated place that is protected. And this is really an outgrowth of our history. Uh, of course, there were people here before Europeans came, right? And the people who were here had what's called a land tenure system, which means they had a system of, of using the land and knowing who used it for what. In fact, they had many different systems. But their systems were generally very different from that of the Europeans who came from a place where land was very finite, which is one reason they were here, uh, and where the idea of ownership and control of land uh, was very deeply ingrained in European culture and the political system. And so, when we know many, many stories of, of this and the whole sad, very sad history of of treaties and agreements with Native American nations and what happened. Uh, but underlying that was the idea that land should be owned by an entity. And there should be a piece of paper saying this entity, an individual organization, a state, a government, owns this land. 
And that was because in Europe, crown land was protected for the royalty to hunt, to keep the, the riffraff out so they wouldn't deplete it. And this was the model that uh, when uh, uh, people started seeing the massive depletion of Western uh, fauna and flora, fauna especially, uh, that uh, uh, this model was applied. Now, in the 1960s uh, especially, this was exported from America, and the first places it was exported to was Africa uh, by people who were well-meaning, and they were trying to so they saw uh, resources in Africa being depleted in a number of ways and saw uh, uh, the American model as being an effective way to preserve uh, uh, land. Of course, just like here, in Africa, people lived with wildlife resources for millennia. Right? The people that I worked with in Botswana had lived in that spot for their ancestors for 50,000 years, 75,000 years. You know what? They hadn't depleted the, the resources until after colonialism, until after people were paying for hides and other things. And, and uh, the, the, the value of animals changed. So the American model was applied throughout Africa. Uh, you know, here, this is a, a picture of a house, in, someone's house in Botswana. Uh, and people like this, living like this, were moved off their land throughout Africa uh, and uh, not allowed to use the resources that they used for generations, for food, for building, for other things. Uh, and often settled into the undesirable land where it's very difficult to get resources out of the environment, which is why they could be there. Sound familiar? It's not not dissimilar to what happened in Australia, what happened in North America. Uh, and people in these situations are subject to a lot of what is euphemistically called diseases of civilization, right? Uh, terrible diets, exposure to alcohol and drugs, other illnesses, idleness because there's no, no work, uh, dysfunction in the family as a result, their culture, uh, cultural knowledge and identity disrupted and lost. And it's a very, very sad uh, situation. Right? Very, very desperate sort of situation. And one response to this was the idea that, uh, and uh, Michael and Jane talked a little bit about this in the context of ecotourism, that community-based programs of natural resource management, if people could manage their own resources, have some stake in it, uh, work cooperatively, that there would be, they would accrue the benefits and that they, the resources could be managed in a way that people could use them, but not deplete them. And people developed more sophisticated management plans with multiple uses of, multiple areas of use, like buffer zones around parks, etc. Some of these have worked pretty well, others have not, and what's wrong, I was in, very deeply involved in developing the, these plans, and they've had mixed results. These are a lot of things, very, very fragile experiments, and uh, there's a lot of things that need to come into line for them to work. Uh, Michael brought up the issue of who gets the, the who's in control, uh, who, uh, where is the benefit actually going, right? So we say a community. Well. You know, it's a, it, it's, what's a community actually mean? A community is a number of individuals. And so if we say, oh, this is great, all the resources are going to the community, but in reality they're going to a couple of individuals within the community, that system isn't going to be very sustainable. Right? So these are very, very difficult uh, things to accomplish well. So, and back to a case study that I'm going to just bring up. Uh, from Botswana, as I mentioned, I spent a lot of time there. Uh, the landlocked country in South Central Africa. So world leader in conservation, recognized all over the world. The president uh, has been very, very dedicated to conservation. The patron of the Kalahari Conservation Society. He uh, has, has been very active in preserving resources. But it's a great example in Africa, the democratic government. Uh, it's like a 1.1 party state, just a little bit past the one party state. Uh, there hasn't yet been a peaceful transition